Hello there. Welcome back to The Bleeding Truth. I'm Sally McNally, the Irish midwife. And I'm Bridget, Sally's daughter. And we're continuing with our episodes with powerful women that we know and are getting to know. And today we have a wonderful lady, Wendy Steiger. She is a sexual counsellor and a sexuality counsellor. She has some very interesting information for us today and I can't wait to get chatting with her. I know Wendy for many years. Uh, She was one of the midwives that used to come to the hospital where I used to work. And she always amazed us with her energy and her beautiful deliveries. And uh, she's well known here in Ventura County. All the women love you, by the way. (laughs) So, yeah, thank you so much for joining us, Wendy. Um, How about, do you mind telling us a little bit about you know, your history as a midwife to now a sexuality counselor. And um, yeah, what does it mean to be a sexuality counselor? Sure. Okay. So thank you to, you know, for having me on here. It's kind of exciting. And I'm so um, inspired by the two of you. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's really good to see you, Sally. I never seem to see you except for bumping into you here and there. I know. (laughs) I miss you. I know. And as Sally mentioned, I've uh, worked in Ventura for a very long time as a nurse midwife and uh, done full scope women's health care pretty much the whole time. And probably the last five or six years have um, really gotten not so much in the birthing anymore. Um, I like to sleep all night now. It's very- <laughs> um, so I do. I've been doing lots and lots of menopausal stuff and women's health care. And probably about 15 years ago, um, you know, through my career, I was sort of tangentially asking about sexual function in my office setting. But I really got into it a whole lot more about 15 years ago. And, And it sort of was amazing that when you ask people about their sexual functioning, they will actually tell you about it yeah. or at the very least I noticed they would like store it away that this is a safe place to talk about sex mm. and so <clears throat> I went back to school and I um, I mean I had a long history of knowing about women's bodies and sexuality but very little about men so I studied more about men and um, got certified as a sexuality counselor through ASECT, which is the American Association of Sex Educators, Counselors, and Therapists. So they're pretty much the licensing certifying body in the United States of, uh, I I can't say all people dealing with sexuality, counseling, or therapy, but but most. Um, So so the the sex educators are kind of, um, you know, probably teaching health in school or Uh, some basic anatomy stuff in a Planned Parenthood setting, something like that. And then on the other side are the actual sex therapists. And so I fall in the middle. I'm a sexuality counselor, as you mentioned. Um, A sex therapist is actually someone who is also um, licensed as some sort of therapist, like a marriage and family therapist or a trauma therapist. Mm or a licensed clinical social worker. I am not that. I'm not licensed in that way by the state of California, just certified by ASECT. And so as a counselor, what I do and what most counselors do is we see individuals and couples who deal with the most common issues that people deal with throughout their life cycle in, in relation to their sexuality. So really common things I see are orgasm problems, ejaculation and erection problems, definitely desire and arousal problems. Probably one of the most common things I see is um, mismatch desire. So when one Mm. person in a relationship is wanting to engage a whole lot more than the other and it's causing distress, that's probably the most common thing I treat. Um, Mm -hmm. Probably, I imagine in a scenario like that, it could be, well, maybe the the man in the relationship might be saying, 
we barely have sex. It's like only once or twice a week. And and in in his wife or his partner's mind, she's probably thinking, he always wants it and we're having sex all the time. It's like twice a week. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, you know, perspective is a big part of this whole thing, you know. You're right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. That's true. Yeah. And um, yeah, so... And I do also do a lot of sexual pain now. And I don't know if you mm. were aware of that, Sally, but, um, and it's beautiful because I can do the therapy piece. And oh at gosh, least for the yes. women, I can do a physical exam and it's see like, perfect. oh, you have yes. this going on, not just this going on, which then it's all right. interrelated. Yeah. Oh, that's so perfect. Yeah. Yeah, it's really great. And it's, yeah. it's, it's wonderful. It's fascinating and exciting and it's heartbreaking sometimes too mm. yeah mm -hmm. yeah i so, come across a bit of that in in my own practice as a, a nurse midwife um you know you're doing their paps or they're going into menopause and and they say i my libido is low or they'll say it's painful um mm. And of course, the, the tissues might be dry or thinner because she's lost weight or, you know, sometimes it's like obvious why it's painful. Right. Um, and, you know, but we don't have a whole lot in our arsenal, so we send them to you. And I appreciate that. I love it. It's like, <laughs> hey, I got one of Sally's patients. <laughs> And, I'm sure know, after this, you're going to get a lot more. Oh, that would be great. That's, I can quit my day job, as they say. <laughs> so that's, you know, that's kind of how I got into it. And it's very broad strokes of, you know, what I do as a sexuality counselor. So I'm very sensitive to, you know, like if somebody came in who was, you know, repeatedly molested or abused or raped as a child, yeah, they're definitely going to have issues with their sexual functioning as an adult, but they need to do the trauma piece. I don't, that's not my right. expertise and I'm very sensitive about what's out of my scope of practice. So sometimes we'll do tan, they'll see a, what I call a regular therapist and me at the same time. Uh -huh. Aha. Yeah. 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 Yes. Because we're multidimensional, aren't we? Yeah. Yes. yes. I think it's so fascinating just that that your job exists because I feel like up until talking to my mom about it I didn't know that was even like a thing right and I, I bet there's a lot of people out there that aren't aware that you can get help with that um in in a relationship or like for my mom's main example is if you're pregnant or just had a baby or something and struggling you know who do you go to if say like Sally's job doesn't necessarily have that scope. I think it's cool that there are, you know, your position out there to, to help. Yeah. Thank you. And I know for your mom, as well as me, I mean, our hearts have always been in helping the whole woman or family, or in this case, mm -hmm. now have, you know, the whole gamut, but you know, and that's what it's really all about. Because we're both yeah. yogis. <laughs> we like to connect the mind, the body, and the spirit and make it whole. Make it whole. Actually, isn't that a concept? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, to that point, a lot of the issues that I see, and, and to be perfectly honest, more with women, is they can't get out of their minds. And, mm. and so they're having sex and they're I'm like thinking, you know, like, oh, I got to go to my mother-in-law's thing tomorrow and I got to get that Costco. And then they're wondering why they're not, you know, getting aroused or it's like, well, you have to come into the body and the spirit and the soul. You can't. Yeah. Be yeah and that's. Yeah. So yeah. That's like the whole focus on being more present in general. Right. Like I. I feel like that's something that's helped me, not not necessarily in that specific area, but in all areas, right. you know, when when you're doing something, but you're thinking about all these other things that you have to do, or you're, you're doing something and you're having a conversation with someone else in your head or fighting about something, then it's so much harder to enjoy whatever you're doing or right. be productive and stuff. So, yeah, so, like, so to learn to be here now. Yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah. I mean, our society has put so much 
so much energy and pressure into the multitasking is a good thing and doing more mm-hmm. and more. But we know that you're not effective at anything when you're multitasking, right? Yeah. Really. Yeah. yeah. That's, so, so, I, that's how I agree. I right. think do one thing at a time. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Wendy, for um, for me, I, like a lot of my patients are young women who have just had babies, young yep. people who've just had babies. Mm-hmm. Um, and I see them for their six week postpartum check. And um, sometimes I'm checking them, their body's all healed and everything's back to normal. And I say to them, so now you're clear to have intercourse if you want to. And she's like, oh, I'm not going to tell him that. Right. So <laughs> her body is ready, but her mind or her heart or some other part is not ready. So I tell them, just wait, take your time. You know, both of you should be ready. Yeah. What if I see her back in a year and she still is not ready? Should I have waited that long or should I have sent her to you before that? Uh, you know, I think it's always it's always really got to be patient or client driven, you know, because especially with sexual things, you can't go after. It's like you can't you can lead a horse to water, right? You can you can yeah. give mm-hmm. it, them my card and say, if you need this person anytime, you know, that kind yeah, of, thing. okay. Um, but yeah, right. you know, it's, it's a process and you know, it's a process and, and you know, there's so many things involved with even very young postpartum women. Yeah. It's a myriad of things, you know, they're exhausted, right. you know, the, if they're still breastfeeding, their hormones aren't back to normal. So they're yeah. not making enough estrogen, which mm-hmm. gives them libido and gives them, you know, the fluffy, happy, juicy vagina, which, yeah. so then maybe they went and tried intercourse. And of course, I know you're telling them to use lubricant right away after. Um, but so maybe they did have intercourse and it hurt. And so, you know, they mm. are not wanting to engage again. And then they think, what's wrong with me? And this is not just postpartum. This is also with menopausal women. It's yeah. like, you know, I have no libido. Well, then you start talking to them and it's like, well, it really hurts. It's like, well, that's perfect. Your body is telling you exactly, like, why would you want to do something more that Mm. hurts? Yeah, (laughs) right. So, you know, you have to honor that. And then it it takes, you know, in your setting, because I've been there, you have like 10 minutes, right? Yeah. We right, can't yeah. unearth I try to beg things. for a few more minutes, but it's true. <laughs> <laughs> They're knocking on the door. Come on. 15 <laughs> minutes. It's like you barely can touch the surface of yeah. what's really going on in the relationship. Yeah. You know, it's mm, so true. Yeah. People will always be like, no, my partner's great. And then you let them talk some more and more and more and more and more. He never yeah. cleans up. He doesn't help me. I'm exhausted. You know, right. It's all on me. Yeah. The baby's on me all day. And then he wants to be on me. And I'm like, ah, give me my body. You know, It's so Heart true. Back. It's so true. Right. And, and we do like a little mental health screen. We offer contraception. But if he's not doing his part of like pulling his weight or helping her to get some sleep, She's right. going to have, you know, bad feeling towards him. Right. I have quite a lot of women who have that. Yeah. And just to be, just to be fair, because especially Bridget, I know you're in this, you know, milieu of this. It could be two female, you know, two females. Right. Together, right. And there still can yes. be a female who's also not carrying so true. weight, you know. So but, true. Um, you know, what I often, what I often tell people is, Even if you're not ready for intercourse, try to make sure there's some kind of intimacy, which doesn't have to include intercourse, because we're so goal directed in this society of it's got to be penis and vagina or else it doesn't count, you know? (laughs) Yeah. That's that's no good. (laughs) And so what I've heard from, you know, so many men is I, I can go a really long time without intercourse. I just can't go a really long time without being appreciated. Oh, mm. yeah. interesting. Or well, yeah, without some emotional yep. contact. Yeah. yeah, 
because so many women, not just postpartum women, they're like, oh, I'm not going to be nice and touch him and kiss him because then he's going to think it's time to have intercourse and I can't right. do it. So I just right. won't touch him or tell right. him he looks hot or anything like that. And then the yeah. intimacy is gone. Yeah. It's like we're not having a shower together, okay? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I need 10 minutes by myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So what about menopause? Of course, that's a huge thing, isn't it? For, um, for, for women. And sometimes I, I meet women and it makes me cry inside listening to their story where they're like, oh yeah, of course I still like it, but I don't want to have sex because it hurts or because I don't have orgasms or whatever her story is. Mm -hmm. um, and then I go to do an examination or a pap and I, her vagina is tight and, and mm -hmm. you know, it's like really dry. And uh, of course, I do think of you, Wendy, in a case like that. Thanks. But like what we do, <laughs> I think about you numerous times throughout the day. <laughs> what would Wendy do? <laughs> Like uh, most of the time I offer, you know, do they want hormone replacement or estrogen cream? Um, but I, I know that that's not enough. I know I'm falling short. Yeah. Well, again, it's a time crunch. You know, you can't do that much in a short period of time. But, you know, I, I get to do that and that's beautiful, you know. And so you know, you're totally on the right track. Like the first thing is, you know, let's make your vagina feel better because it's fine to not want to have intercourse if you don't like the guy or whatever. Right. If you do and it just hurts, we can make it not hurt. And you can do that, as you're saying, just by vaginal estrogen, because a lot of women are like, no, I don't want to take hormones. And you can explain, you know, we can just use it in the vagina. It's super low risk and it works like probably for 98% of women, if they use it right. And, you, you know, yeah. like everything else, you have to be really clear about instructions because you've experienced it. I'm mm -hmm. sure you tell them how to do it right. They come back and say it didn't work. And you ask them, how did they do it? Well, I used it a couple of times. It didn't work. It's like, no, that's not how it is. You know, you got to do it every night for a couple of weeks. And then, you know, a couple of times. So interesting. And, and I do like to, to tell these women that, you know, you're having a normal response. It hurts. So yeah. why would you want to desire something that hurts? Yeah. So it normalizes and it allow, gives them permission to feel what they're feeling, right? Right. And so then, then oh, sorry, yeah. Wendy. Yeah. Do you then teach them how to help themselves so that it doesn't hurt? Like, do you teach them anything like other than the cream? Do you teach them how to use dilators? It depends. You know, there's, I'd say there's a few other things that are really common. So if someone hasn't had sex in a really long time, either, you know, there was a divorce or a death or, a, um, you know, some kind of medical illness or just, you know, whatever the situation is, and then they're ready to be sexual again, you know, you have to give a, a pretty good long amount of time. I mean, like minimum two months, I'd say of estrogen in the vagina. And then I would like have them start with like, maybe that person might do well with dilators. And then there's also these people who have really hypertonic pelvic floor muscles, right? Because we've gotten all this stuff from media that you have to do your million kegels a day and you have to do Pilates and women are walking around with their, you know, squeezing all the time. And then they can't, nothing will go in without pain. Oh, wow. So yeah. And women, you know, we tend to hold our urine all the time. As, <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, I got to pee. Wait, I have one more thing to do. Oh, okay. Yeah. I really have to go. Oh, wait, I have to do those two other things. And then you just have this level of increased tone in your vaginal mm. muscles. Too toned. Yeah. Just so too strong down. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm and glad so, you're telling me this. Yeah. <laughs> I've learned so much already. It's been fun. <laughs> you know, I, I, I know I need to come and talk to you. When, sometimes when they come back and they've had like a baby or maybe three babies, you know, um, and the vagina, it does feel a little laxer, you know, right. sometimes it is stretched. 
Um, So I tell them, okay, here's your vagina. Imagine somebody's giving you a small tampon and you're going to squeeze it and hold on to it. Yeah. But of course, that's doing what's not wanted if they're, you know, wanting to have sex. Right. right? And it's rare. It is pretty rare that you'll get both of those things, I think, at the same time, a really lax muscle tone and hyper tone right. but you know we have really good female pelvic floor physical therapists sometimes. i know we're gonna have one on the podcast hopefully oh soon. great who are you having can you say that <laughs> not yet <laughs> stay so, tuned um, right yeah yeah <laughs> but they can be so helpful they can do what we can't do right yes mm-hmm. for right. sure yeah so it's always good you know having a team but um yeah so, okay, so back, we're back to the estrogen in the vagina for these menopausal women. And then, you know, a couple of other things that are super important to, to tease out. You know, w- one thing that's a golden thing to share, and you can do it really quickly in a, a post, a, 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 you know, an annual gynecologist yeah, you know, right. in this yeah. situation is explain that. And, and this is a, a fairly new paradigm because it was always, you know, Masters and Johnson, which the sexual response cycle was based on what? Men, of course. Yeah, right. <laughs> the only different sexual response cycle than women, right? But yeah. There's been a lot of other great women who've really nailed it down. Yeah. And so if you remind women in that age group, 45, 55, 65, we don't have what's called spontaneous desire anymore. You're right. <laughs> we have what's, you know, much past 20, 25, 30, maybe up till 35. You'll have spontaneous desire where you're like, oh my God, I like have to rip your clothes off right now and we have to have sex, right? Not when you're 55, but what we have is called spontaneous desire, uh-huh. which means. Okay, so you told me you love if you love the guy and you're doing it for the good of the relationship, you show up. Mm. And then what happens is at some point he, you start kissing and making out and touching, and then you're like, "Oh, right, I like this. This feels good." Then you start to get aroused, yeah. okay. and then you have desire, and okay. then it's, it's that kind of cycle. So, for a lot of women, it takes a lot of pressure off of oh, okay, I'm normal, right? Like, mm-hmm. I do have that kind of desire, but I don't have that other, which I think I'm supposed to still have. Right. So when, you, when you're younger, you have what kind of desire? Spontaneous, just out of the blue. You're driving PCH, you see the guy, you know, changing out of his <laughs> wetsuit, and you're like, oh my God, I have to go home and jump on my man's bones, or your female partner, or whoever bones you're jumping on, right? <laughs> That, does, it, that doesn't really happen, especially because you That's have... That's spontaneous. You know, and then older, what, what do you, you call that one? The older responsive. one? So you oh, responsive. responsive. Okay. Yeah, was I not... No, out? I understand. I, yeah. I thought you said spontaneous for both, but that makes sense. Responsive. That's even when you're younger too, though. Yes, there it is. <laughs> that's like... Oh, that's true. Yeah. That's like most I, I don't know i don't want to just generalize to women but i feel like that's most mostly you know how it is yeah right. you know really i'm exhausted and i have this paper and i have to do this and that and it's like whatever but then you're like okay i'll show up and you're like oh wow this kind of feels good and now i'm getting yes <laughs> and, and if that's not happening for these women who are 55 six something's going on in the relationship Right. 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 Yes. But also that um, spontaneous desire for a woman, it can show up, especially when she's ovulating, because Mother Nature's like, let's, you know, reproduce now. So when she's <laughs> ovulating, their partner looks particularly beautiful or handsome, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> for Mel's those 12 hours. Too, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. But maybe not so much when she's having her period. Right. That is very it's true. interesting. So thanks. That's so interesting. Yeah. 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 So then for the older people, 
Um, mm-hmm. if, if we older ones have good relationships with the people that we happen to have spent years with or, or these new relationships, then there's more likely then we'll have a response to response them to that will lead to, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, all right. Yeah, yeah. That's that's just a little piece. I mean, obviously, yeah, I you know, love there's that. a whole world happening that you can't separate from your relationship. Mm-hmm. Right? So, may I ask you, Wendy, for for your um, your talk with the people? Would you bring in both uh, members of the relationship and sit them down and try to go back and forth and see if that response is appropriate? Yeah. So as far as, you know, when I see people and I'd say my practice is probably about 50, 50, some individuals come in alone, a lot come in with their partners. There's often, there's often one partner who says it's your problem. It's not my problem. You take care of this. That's Mm. a problem right away. Okay. Right. Yeah. But you can't make somebody come in. Right. Yeah. And and sometimes initially one partner, whether it's a man or a woman, and it's not, it's probably equal. They don't want the other one to come in right away. They want a couple of visits just with me alone to kind of figure it out a little bit. And then we'll invite, you know, the other person. Oh, right. Because, you know, Sometimes what I do is I just educate. Right. And a yeah. lot of times, you know, and you've probably heard this, like, can you come home and tell my husband that? Like he yeah. doesn't believe it when I say it, right? Right. Yeah. If you're paying a, a you know, a professional who's trained, you know, they yeah. might they might get it better. So sometimes right. I'm just educating people, whether it's yeah. about sexual functioning in men versus women or a this person versus that person. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes it's just that. Mm. I don't know too much about the ma- the, the male parts. <laughs> don't <laughs> even know bit. what that is. I know a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's great fun, the Ghibli bits. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, for a man, sometimes it's, it's hard. When, as they get older, if they start having <laughs> erectile dysfunction yeah. and mm. it's, Sometimes they'd rather not have to deal with it, right? That yes. if that starts happening while they're having sex with their partner, they get embarrassed. They yep. uh, discourage, maybe, they feel, and then they may feel rejected if she laughs or whatever her yes. response would be. So, yes. do you do you deal with that aspect of it too? I do. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know. Poor men, there's so much pressure on them, really. Right. You yeah. know, in the media and the movies, yeah. like, you're a man, you should want it all the time. You should be able to get an erection mm-hmm. anytime, anywhere with any person. And yeah. that's what they grow up with. And, yeah. you know, like you say, until they're probably 50, give or take, they will get an erection no matter what. Right? <laughs> yeah. Right. And it's so, yeah. you know, I, my heart really goes out because it's so painful for men when that starts to not happen. I'm sure. Mm, and, it's yeah. scary yeah. and it's bewildering. And, 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 uh, you know, I got to tell you, sadly, more than one man that I've seen, many of them, they have been shamed at some yeah. point. <gasps> yeah. In their life, you know, when, when they're 30 or something like, oh, what's wow. wrong with yeah. you? Aren't you a real man? Can't you get it up? And that is like, oh my God. Oh. And they yeah. carry that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I had this, sometimes it's very easy and I love when it is. And I love when people actually, like I give them homework, home play and, you know, people who do it actually move along. But, you know, there was this one man and he was quite old, um, meaning like, I think he was in his early eighties and he was going out with this woman and she was, you know, in his words, like hot to trot and, <laughs> he couldn't get an erection and um, we talked about it some more and it came out that he actually didn't like her. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) And, you know, I, I, I asked him, you know, what happens when you try to self pleasure or if you watch or read pornography, it's like, I get erections. I said, there's nothing wrong with you. Your penis is telling you she's (laughs) not the one for you. 
listen to your penis. You know? right. Right. And he did. And he met another woman and he was having erections and it was beautiful. You know? wow. Interesting. Yeah. It was a lovely story. That is so interesting. I know. So, Simple fix. You know, there's, and, and again, nowadays men have a lot of pressure too. And we think we don't, we don't think it should affect them like us. So they're under pressure for a deadline and they had to take care of their mother and their kids and a million hours at work and they're exhausted. And, you know, these things affect them too. And it's a lot of that treatment is just, you know, breaking the negative cycle of, oh shit, what if it happens again? Mm -hmm. So then you're projecting that it's going to and you're thinking and you're not in your body. And then, you know, getting away from the it's no good if you don't have an erect penis like what about all the other stuff that you can do you know yeah. so right right take the, trying to take the pressure I'm, off of that i'm curious i hope it's not inappropriate to bring it up but i want to know what your opinion is when it comes to porn and relationships and you know i know a lot of young people have addiction to that type of stuff and you know it can harm relationships and or just make it harder to enjoy reality or something because the expectations are so high sometimes um yeah. Yeah. but it could also be good in some situations too depending on the individual um yeah. But yeah, what is your experience or take on it? Um, I, I have a lot of uh, different feelings about it. You know, number one, I would say, and sadly, this is the case, you should never be using porn as your sex education. Yeah. Because <laughs> that's the movies, right? Like we know, like in, you know, like Star Wars. You, you don't watch Law and Order to be a cop. <laughs> or... <laughs> <laughs> crime shows <laughs> and, and, and you know, like all oh, right this is this doesn't really happen in real life but mm -hmm. everybody believes like oh i should be like that in real life like wh what's you know what's that all about and yeah. it does it gives it gives i think by and large a lot of a misinformation and this thing that people feel men and women they have to measure up to you know they have to look a certain way so then that causes doubt and shame and I'm not normal. I mean, Sally, you probably deal with this. I get at least probably once a week, a young woman who comes in and says, I don't like my labia. What's wrong with them? Oh, yes. Yes. And really? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yes. Because they're watching porn and everybody's tucked exactly. and nipped in like a yeah. little baby vagina, you know, vulva. And so I have requesting a surgery. Yeah. Yep. Oh, very young teenagers. Yeah. yeah. And so I have some books that show real labia. I have some websites that I send them to if they want to see, you know, on video, like this is what women really look like. And most men will love your labia because it's real labia and it's not on a screen and they get to look at it and play with it and see everything that it does. You know? <laughs> And they're like, no, oh, that's like, that's normal. I'm like, yep. And so are you. And you really want to start cutting on this tissue that's full of nerve endings and then maybe not have, you know, pleasure. Yeah. But, but um, so that is a part, you know, like, right. oh, well, I have to be able to have an erection for 10 hours. So that's, then you yeah, that's even more extreme than I had even thought about it before. But yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I can believe it. Yeah. Hey, I'm from Ireland. What's pornography? <laughs> <laughs> they don't even have the internet over there. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, no, I'm only joking. Of course, I'm only joking. But uh, when I was going to school, you know, I remember uh, it was all girls school. We had the nuns, of course. And I remember um, a nun stopping me in the middle of the corridor in school once. And she said, well, you, Sally, you're having bad thoughts. And I'm like, why would she think that? She told me I was having bad thoughts. And I don't know. I think she was having bad thoughts. Yeah, she was <laughs> it stuck with me because I then, I, you know, like I, I, for years afterwards, I was like, oh, my God, is it obvious that I'm thinking about sex or 
You know? Sally was just there biting her lip like, <laughs> I think I you're know. having bad thoughts. You're having bad thoughts? <laughs> I was, how can you tell? Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't yeah. grinding my hips or anything. <laughs> you were just walking normal. <laughs> Maybe I was wriggling my hips. There you go. That I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's so much shame that's set up, you know, by these different institutions. That's right, the shame. Mm -hmm. And you know, though, the shame kind of made it more fun in a way because oh, yeah. it, was, it was naughty, you know, yeah. it was like really naughty. Yeah, that made it better. <laughs> Sorry, Bridget. <laughs> I'm not surprised by anything anymore. Don't worry. <laughs> But, so the other things about porn is, you're right, I think it can be a problem if young men or women are, you know, spending hours and hours and doing a certain kind of, you know, masturbation pattern that they can't repeat with a real live human being. That can be very tricky to work with. Um I don't much buy into the porn addiction thing mm. because it's so easy to shame people. Oh, and, it, you know, if you stop watching porn, you're not going to like start vomiting or getting cold sweats or that's true. Yeah. you're going to be crabby, you know, <laughs> but you're not going to have a physical withdrawal. So oftentimes it's the partner who feels left out or not measuring up to the porn who wants to call it a porn addiction and send that guy or woman to sex addicts anonymous and really it's a relationship problem and it's not really a porn problem okay but so but, it's it's possibly like something that happens to people in the very extreme circumstances sure okay. but not necessarily the everyday issue with it yeah, I mean, I, I've seen a few people who really, really, they just, they couldn't stop, you know, they, mm -hmm. and they have to go through a whole different kind of programming thing. And I have some good referrals for that. But, but there is a, you know, as you said, sometimes for some couples, porn can help. Um, and I have a list of like, you know, feminist porn. So because a lot of women are like, especially of our age, Sally and I, like, yeah. oh, that's so, you know, sexist and so misogynistic. And in our line of work as well, when we're trying to build women up, um, yeah. mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to then send them to something that might, you know, bring women down. Yeah. You know? so but feminist porn of sounds... videos that are like <laughs> by women who own yeah. the companies who have much more of a feminist point of view. Interesting. And there's a really good book, um, and I love the title too. And this can be, this could be for a, a, a man because it's a little bit more common, but not always, um, who wants to watch porn and his female partner is having a problem with it, and how to invite her in and not push anything. And it's called Ethical Porn for Dicks. <laughs> Okay. The link will be in the description below to Amazon. No, I'm just kidding. It's, it's, it's actually quite a good book, but you know, really, you know, yeah. So, it's, yeah, it's a mixed bag. It's definitely a mixed bag. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely like I feel like depending on you know what your your lifestyle is or the your beliefs and stuff that can, you know, really make it something that works for you or not, you know, and or well, some, et ethical, some ground. ethical porn sounds like it's directed by the right people. Um, I, my problem with porn would always be that I couldn't guarantee that the people I was looking at were doing this of their own volition that they that this is what they chose to do with their life mm. um and I, I couldn't be you know spiritually convinced that they were happy with this so i couldn't partake because you know in watching it because it wouldn't um feel right yeah uh, well does that well, make sense ethical, totally ethical who, who make you know make some decent porn i guess now 
Well, of course, jealousy comes up too, right? Uh, for the porn, if they're watching porn together, one or the other could get jealous because somebody else is turning their partner on. Uh, how do you deal with that? How would you help them with that? Well, I think, you know, I think people who are open to exploring with different ways they can grow as a couple and knowing that, okay, if we're watching this together, it's not going to lead to her going out or going in a chat room or, you know, all the myriad technical ways you can, you know, access if not exactly physical relationships, pretty close to it, you know, yeah. outside of a, outside of a, a marriage yeah. thing. Yeah. Then you have to, you just have to have a, a, a realistic and vulnerable conversation because again, it's usually more women who are like, I want my husband to stop watching porn. That's what I was going to say. Almost every man watches porn. So if you're a woman out there and you think your man is not watching porn, you're wrong. Like every man I've ever seen, ever treated, watches porn. And, and you know, they can watch it like once in a blue moon or once every two weeks or, you know, and it's not problematic. They still want to be with their partner. They want the real live connection and, you know, spiritual, you know, psychological comforting, whatever, all of it. And so it's not a problem at all. But when there's discord already in a relationship, then what happens, and again, not always, but a little bit more, it's the women who are like, they want him to stop watching it because they're not comfortable and she has bigger breasts and she does all these things I don't want to do and I'm not measuring up. And so again, it's back to, it's not really a porn problem. It's a relationship problem. Ah, so if, okay. you know, if we're talking together, uh, you know, like, do we want to do this together? Am I going to feel jealous? Yeah, maybe. But if you're turned on and then we're turning one another on, then it's okay. You know, it's not, mm -hmm. but you know. So, so it, it can be a therapeutic thing for these couples who have, you know, lost their togetherness. It can be you know, sometimes. Yeah. I, I, I would say. Right. I think that's, it, it's very interesting. I think it, it takes, the willingness of people to, I'm not the counselor, right? But it takes the willingness of people to have the open conversation or bring someone in or, you know, even just, I don't know, talk to you about it to actually make it something that will benefit, right? Yeah. Like have, have the conversation. <laughs> yeah. Notice, notice that there is an issue, right? Right. And that, yeah. Bridget, that is like the, the greatest point because, you know, when I said sometimes it's heartbreaking, you know, there are simple things that people are not talking about for years. And then they come to me, mm -hmm. you know, when they're 65, they've been with this partner for mm -hmm. 20 years. And, you know, things that in any other sphere they can talk about. And so, you know, just right. a very simple thing, like, you know, it'll be like, well, you know, and back to the why women don't want to engage maybe when they're 60 or 50, you know, because maybe for 40 years, he's been doing stuff that she doesn't like. It doesn't feel good. It's not turning her on. Right. And just, that's trust. Just, so like if the trust is broken, it's hard to, to accept anything of it or want to involve yourself, right? That makes sense too. That's yeah. valid. Yes, absolutely. And then there's that thing of, why didn't you tell him for 30 years that you didn't like it? Why did you mm, right. pretend you liked it? Why? And, and you know, this is, a, this is a big bad one for some people. I mean, mostly women, because it's a lot harder for men to fake orgasms, right? And so women, <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> And I tell them, don't ever, don't ever fake an orgasm because what happens is then he thinks all those things he just did worked. Oh, and men right. want to yeah. So they're going to do the same thing over because they want to win, you know? Yeah. And, and then people come to me 30 years later because it's been awful for 30 years because they didn't Aww. just say, 
Could you go slower? Could you go to the left more? It's Mm -hmm. like, I tell them not to be glib, but if you're hiking with your partner and he's zooming ahead of you, you have no problem saying, honey, could you slow down? But in the bedroom, uh uh-oh, I can't say those same words. Honey, could you please slow down? What's the difference? Same words. (laughs) That's so interesting. Do you think... Do you think, Wendy, that sometimes um, one partner, mostly I would imagine women, would put up with um, the behavior or the type of sex that he offered her for years and years because she'd be afraid to say, no, I don't like it in case he went to find it from somebody else. But then when she's older in her 60s, she's like, well, he's very unlikely to stray now. So I could say, no, I don't want you to touch me. (laughs) I can just imagine that scenario. Yeah, I, sure. I mean, that, there's so many scenarios and reasons why, right? Why we don't. Yeah. So, what prefer. about foreplay? Um, in Ireland, we used to have this joke. Uh, we, we say, "Have you heard of Irish foreplay?" And the other person would say, "No," and <laughs> then you'd say, "Brace yourself, Mary." <laughs> And that's, that's Irish foreplay. <laughs> it used to make me laugh so much. <laughs> but now I'm sad about it, you know, <laughs> because I think that's kind of sad that, you know, that we couldn't <laughs> have been Slow more down. like the French. Slow down. Right. Slow down, Patrick. <laughs> Right. I got a whole lots of other parts on me other than that, those three, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Right. Well, yeah, it's it's terrible, actually. And, you know, on some level, like I I try to not even call it foreplay because then then there's a little bit of a, a sense of, oh, that's just the stuff you have to do to get to penis and vagina. Right as opposed to that in and of itself is love and sex and sensuality, yeah. you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and foreplay there's... could be doing the dishes. <laughs> I explain that to men all the time. Like, or feeding the you know, That is such a great point. <laughs> well, really, I mean, like most men have heard that foreplay starts in the kitchen and they don't get it. It's like, because- I think I should take some notes. More. <laughs> what did you say, Bridget? I said I'm taking notes. <laughs> yeah, 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 right, and that's true. You know, doing things for your partner that maybe you don't love to do, but you know, help her feel more relaxed and more open and more loving and more able to get into her physical body to be receptive. You know, or yeah. want. Mm-hmm to be sexual yeah and and now sally there's lots of you know good studies with all kinds of biofeedback machines that show and and i talk i do talk about foreplay i'm like okay so tell me about that is it like kiss kiss touch your nipple then your other nipple and then we're having penetration and and that's unfortunately (laughs) kind of you know what happens sometimes and we know now by all these you know great MRI studies and everything else that it takes way, way longer for Mm -hmm. female or a body with a vagina and breasts to truly get physiologically aroused, like way longer than we ever thought till there's a lot of lubrication and fluffing and plumping and blood flow. And, you know, so. Yeah. um, Yeah. Yeah. And, and that is That's, a really important piece. When it, when it comes to, say, I don't know if you advise at all, like, does diet and exercise or just activity, like, have influence on people's sex lives or libido? Um, yes, yes. I wonder if that's also, yeah. Yeah, so, like, from a physiological point of view, we know that when people exercise – They make more testosterone. So, you know, there was a sex therapist who was not quite a mentor, but he had a saying, and this goes probably a little bit more for men than women. Um, You know, 
if you can't stand up, how do you expect your penis to stand up? <laughs> I mean, yeah. you, have, you know, yeah. you have men who are overweight, you know, they eat crappy. So they have, you know, some type of diabetes or high blood pressure. And that affects your circulation. Erections are all about circulation, pretty much, you know. And so mm -hmm. sometimes, yeah, you just need to get up off the couch, move your body, get some of those pounds off, get the blood flowing. Um, yeah. And your, your own testosterone levels up by diet, you know, exercise. Right. Um, and then you know, the diet. Yoga. Like, yoga. 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 <laughs> to relax and get into your body and learn to breathe because you know, right. so many it's so good for the glands in your body to release oh, your hormones yeah right really good yeah. yeah so yes there is definitely and as we kind of started the whole thing it's not just about a physical body right, right. it's about the physiology and the you know the spirit and the soul and the you know the emotions and so right. it's all got to be in shape. I have a question for you. So up to this, we've been chatting about people who have problems. They either don't want to or it's painful or they can't. Or, um, and what about uh, people who are hypersexual? I, I've come across a few patients who are like hypersexual, which leads them to uh, behaviors that are very dangerous, of course. Mm -hmm. um, do you see people like that? Can we send them to you as well? You know, I my gut level reaction there is twofold. First of all, um, I, I think we tend to put that sort of label more on women because, you know, still in this society where, you know, brought up that, Men more, the more women you can have, the more sex you can have, the more women, the God, what you know, yeah. But for women, it's like, no, you're a slut, right? Right. Well, right. if some woman has maybe a healthy libido, yeah, and is being more sexual than what her church or her family or the society, then then we're right. like saying, okay, you have a problem. Right. But yes, I get your point. There are people yeah. who have. Right. It could be a physiological thing. And oftentimes it's it's a response to some sort of trauma in, in their young years. And it's, every <laughs> word is so interesting. Yeah. It's so great. <laughs> oh, this is great, you. Wendy. Yeah, I love but, it. Yeah, but the uh, the hypersexual people that I'm thinking of, or that is a wrong term. You're right, because I totally support my patients who have like healthy sex drive and want to make love all the time to whoever they want to. I'm like, go for it, yeah, go. Yeah, I, you're very encouraging. I, <laughs> yes, sorry, I, but I do um, worry about uh, women or anybody who who uh, their mind is fuzzy when when it comes to sex so they don't take precautions they don't use condoms they even sleep with people that they know are sick who may have an std mm -hmm. but they can't seem to stop yeah. so um that's the the one that's the type of patient that i i'm thinking of that i worry yeah. about so that, that might that, not be a hypersexual it's just right. somebody that's maybe not well educated or yeah, emotionally. but even though we try to help them, Bridget, we educate them, but they continuously come back mm. with the STD or, yeah. yeah. There's usually something at the root of that. And, and sometimes they're not sharing. Either there's a lot of drug or alcohol use. And so oh, they, yeah, right. you know, they're not, that, that's not a good mix. Or there's many times there was, you know, some kind of abuse in the family or growing up in a family where sex was, you know, you were watching it as a child, a very young child. Uh -huh. mm. So I would, I would definitely have that person probably see like a, a regular therapist, what I call a regular right. therapist to see, yeah. you know, what's, what's really going on. And some of these people have been shamed so much that they're just like, well, I'm bad. So I'm going to be bad. Right. That this is or, who I am and this is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And now so it's, it's a, like a secondary problem. Right, right. That's um, interesting. And there's one, there's one difference there. And, and, you know, you can sometimes get a sense from the person like that they do feel like they're a bad person for doing that as opposed to, I'm, yeah, I'm fine, which could just be delusion. Um, but there is one situation, you probably heard of it, which I, I haven't treated much and I always have to go back to, uh, you know, my resources and, mm -hmm. and my people that I can turn to when I have something I can't handle. And that's the um, EGAD, Persistent Genital Arousal Disorder. Oh, right. And that's a yeah. whole different thing. And that's, yeah. you know, women yeah. just feeling like they have to, they have to masturbate yeah. multiple times a day mm. to orgasm and it's not fun and it's incredibly distressing, mm. you know, and, yeah. and it's, it's, it's very difficult to manage that. There's different drugs yeah. and things to use. Mm. It's a neuro, it's a neurological wiring thing. Mm. And it's very challenging. And, Interesting. Uh, it's a whole, it's a whole wow. different, it's not like they're out being promiscuous, you know, yeah. but they, they have, they're just always feeling aroused. And even with orgasm, it doesn't go away. Right. So mm -hmm. it's, it's very challenging and they need a lot of support. I've, I've only tangentially dealt with like, I think two people who I had something to do with it with that kind of diagnosis but right. yeah that sounds wow. like it likely is more rare right but yeah it's good that they have wow. you to go to <laughs> at least yeah. some you know some i mean sally you know this just from nursing and being a midwife if we don't have the answers we at least might be able to help them find who does have mm, them. right yeah. that's true yeah definitely right yeah yeah that's good but uh, what I love is that you're able to do that physical exam because mm -hmm. you know exactly how to touch them and how to, you know, view them and, and uh, make them comfortable and so great. Yeah. 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 It's, it's yeah. a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Wendy, you, you went to Guatemala and you have a little home down there, right, as well as here in Ventura. Well, let's see. I went to Guatemala in the Peace Corps, but I bought property in Nicaragua, which is oh, right Nicaragua. now in the, languishing in the court system. But anyway, oh, oh, <laughs> I, have a little, I have a little, a little, I don't, I don't know if I quite call it a home, but a shack on the beach. Yeah, that's nice. <laughs> that's so great. Yeah, totally. yeah. And uh, what I used to love listening to your stories when you went to Tibet, mm -hmm. um, you really inspired me. Someday I hope I do that. Oh, I yeah. want to do that. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about that. About the Tibet piece? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I, I am a, a practicing Buddhist of Tibetan Buddhism. And there was a woman who was a nurse practitioner in my Sangha or my little Buddhist community. And she knew this couple who actually they live in Ojai and they have the mandala restaurant on the way up to oh, Ojai. Yeah. yeah. And they have family and they had a clinic there and, you know, they wanted us to come. So we did. And, uh, it was the nurse practitioner and there was an eye doctor and myself and I did the, uh, I don't, I don't remember. I mean, we were there for a month, but I think the training was probably about two weeks. And it was from ACNM, the American College of Nurse Midwives, basically their program of basic uh, home birth life-saving skills. And so we taught these 10 women, Tibetan women um, in the community, how to do very basic, but, you know, like empty the bladder after the baby is right. she's bleeding, put the baby yeah. to the breast, you know, how mm. to make baby cry, just really basic things because wow. they don't have traditional birth attendance in Tibet. Yeah. So wow. it was really fun. And we had a lot of, we had, a, we had a lot of fun. Um, it was, I would talk in English and then that would get translated into Chinese, which got translated into Amdo. So we, <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's going around. It's so I had my little dolls and we were like playing. It was really mm -hmm. fun. Yeah, that's yeah, it's amazing. Pictures, like that whole, 
program this pictures. So it, it doesn't matter that it's not in, you yeah. know, you can't read or you can't read that language because yeah. you see the woman laying on the floor in a pool of blood. What do you do? You know, so here's the picture. And, right. And, um, wow. Well, yeah. yeah. It was, it was uh, fabulous. It was a fun. Yeah. Tell us about your statue up there behind you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can turn her around a little bit. Is that. Can you, yeah. She's pregnant. I can see right? her belly. Yeah, <laughs> pregnant, and she's some kind of indigenous woman from somewhere. Yeah. I, I, got, I think I got her at a, a, a midwifery conference somewhere. A, yeah, a, probably a, a lay midwifery conference, and I just love it. I mean, she's just full of life, right? Yeah, right. Has this body that is so not what we think in this culture is like the beautiful body, and yeah, you know, it just seemed joyful to me. And, so great. I love Bronze it. And very heavy. So I'm careful not to drop it on my foot. But it's, <laughs> it's so yeah. special. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. you're so special, Wendy. Uh, this has been so yeah. great. Yeah. yeah. You. I love how you just speak openly and so easy. But all of these subjects that for a lot of people, it's hard to even think about some of these subjects, isn't it? Right. And that's, you know, one of the things I ask people after their first session is, what did you like about the session? You know, because I need that for my feedback. Yeah. Um, and and usually it's that I just felt so comfortable talking to you because you were so comfortable just, you know, talking about this yeah. stuff. That yeah, right. It's often so like, mm-hmm. yeah, 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 you know. yeah. 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 So it, w- sometimes it, when I'm doing an exam of a woman, especially with the well woman exam, I ask her all of these questions and I check her body. And mm-hmm. um, I used to say, uh, are you sexually active? Mm-hmm. But now I like to say, are you making love? You yeah. know, um, and sometimes they'll giggle and laugh, you know, or sometimes they'll say, you mean sex? No. <laughs> and it, the answer tells me a lot about what's happening. Right. See, she's on her way to be a sex counselor. <laughs> I think she, she'd love that. She'd I would love, love it. that. <laughs> I'd have to come and train with you, Wendy. Oh, uh, yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> you'd, yeah, you'd have to t- teach me, stop saying, brace yourself, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell them that. <laughs> Okay, never mind. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's how people speak, you know. I mean, and and like you said, that just changing that tells you a lot. And when when somebody calls me up, you know, the way they speak, like it's so sad. So so many men of a certain age, but not just a certain age, will call me up and say, "I need to talk to you because I I just can't perform with my wife." I'm like, yeah. well, first of all, this is not a performance. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But that that lets you know, okay, this guy yeah. already thinks he has to like perform. Right. Yeah. I'm like, okay, we're yeah. not gonna call it that anymore. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Right? yeah. I've heard yeah. that term many times, right? right. Yeah. yeah. Right. But yeah. Wendy, thank Fantastic. you so much. <laughs> yeah. This has fun. just been like a fun conversation. Yeah. yeah really. I loved it. I've been doing my best to not be too revealing. <laughs> hey, but you need to yeah. branch off some more and want to do something else, just let me know. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, Thank you so much, Wendy. And we're going to um, attach your information to this if it's okay, yeah. because yeah, uh, somebody may want to contact you. Yeah. I'm sure they will. Yeah. And if you guys are listening, please make sure to like and subscribe, hit the notification bell. If you guys are on Apple, please leave a review because that helps the bleeding truth out. And we'll see you in the next one. Thank you so much. Thanks for your bleeding truth, Wendy. Thanks a million. (laughs) Thanks a million. Bye. So thanks again for listening. We really appreciate it. And um, if you like what we're doing, give us a bit of a review on Apple. That would help us so much. And um, if you come across a subscribe button, press the subscribe button. It doesn't cost you anything. 